Hello. Hey, I'm back. And at the end, I'm I'm just going to end on the last slide. So uh, and just say thank you so much and looking forward to questions. Perfect. And we are. So you can go ahead and start. Hey, everybody. How you doing? My name is James Hagedorn. I'm the curator of geology here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And as one of the museum scientists, one of the things that I do is I look at rocks, minerals, fossils, and other clues inside rocks to figure out how they formed, what they have to tell us about our planet, both in the past and today, and potentially even in the future. And so today I want to tell you about some rocks. It's something I love, but you know what else I like to do besides look at rocks? I like to surf. Right now I'm in the middle of the country and it's not possible to surf a wave, so why don't we go surf some ancient sandstones instead? All right, I'm going to show you a couple of images here and uh, let's go surf some sandstones. You know, something that people oftentimes ask me is, well, why would I want to go look at those ugly old rocks anyways? What are they good for? Well, it turns out that rocks are actually useful. And one of them right here, the Codell sandstone, which I'm showing you here, there's a couple of my colleagues standing on a, on a hill in Kansas, is actually useful because in Kansas and Nebraska, it's actually an aquifer. It's an it's a, it's a underground rock that stores water that people use to drink and feed animals or give to animals and things like that. And here in Colorado, this rock is actually useful because we get oil and gas out of it. And academically, this rock is actually very useful because um, this rock unit called the Codel is actually from an interval in Earth time, in Earth history, about 100 million years ago, where we kind of have a big gap in knowledge. And so our team of folks at the museum and, and colleagues around have been studying this rock unit, which uh, to try to figure out how it was formed and, and maybe reveal a few of its certain secrets. So let's go surf this sandstone and do a little science, okay? So um, one of the great things about living in Colorado is that in addition to having surface exposures of rocks like the ones I just showed you a second ago, we also have exposures of rocks that uh, um, are uh, come from beneath the blow, beneath the uh, surface below us, where um, folks have drilled into the earth and pulled out cores or thin columns of rocks, like I'm showing here. These are a couple of cardboard boxes filled up with busted up pieces of this rock. And the Codell sandstones above the gray rock over here are all these sort of gray and brown and tan colored rocks over here. And so we're, our team has been looking at cores of rock, um, um, geophysical information about those rocks from below the surface, as well as surface outcrops to get a sense of how it was formed. And I just wanna give a shout out to everyone on the team here, both at the museum and in the community abroad. All the stuff I'm presenting today is work in progress and, and it reflects some um, science um, as we speak, that, that, that comes together through putting our collective minds and knowledge bases together. And it's a lot of fun to do that. So um, one of the things that we love to do is, of course, go to the field. And here's a, a colleague of mine, Rich Botcher, looking at some rocks up near Fort Collins. And he's staring at these things and, and trying to figure out uh, what kind of clues are in the rocks. And sometimes the clues are visible to the naked eye. Like you can see these, this uh, kind of angled bedding here over on the right below my hammer that tells us about currents that might have moved these particles along and the, sometimes there's little divots in the rock like this that are made by burrows by critters cruising in the mud maybe they're worms or or, or maybe little arthropods or sort of shrimp like creatures cruising into the sand um, but these rocks also have other clues um, besides structures they also include fossils so here's one right here and i don't know tap your inner paleontologist what kind of fossil is this mm -hmm. That's right, it's a shark's tooth, just like this one on my neck. Um, and there's lots of these fossils in these rocks. There's vertebrae, like the vertebrae in here, this is the backbone of a kind of fang fish. And here's a tooth of maybe a parrotfish-like critter like in Finding Nemo. And there's all these tube-like things right here. And collectively, we can take information like this from fossils, from structures in the rocks, and get a sense that, broadly speaking, the Codell sandstone, this 100 million year old sandstone, was deposited in the ancient sea. And I think, oh my gosh, Colorado was an ancient sea back in the day. Well, sure enough, because Colorado has been bouncing around on the surface of the planet on top of plates that revolve around the, that move around the planet kind of like big um, sliding uh, hockey pucks, right? And here's Colorado here sliding around back in the Cretaceous period. And meanwhile, dinosaurs are munching on uh, plants and maybe sometimes one another on the shoreline. Most of Colorado was actually underwater for, for a good bit of the Cretaceous time. And so um, when we kind of make a diagram of this, like this one over here on the right, we can envision uh, Colorado, which is kind of outlined here in Wyoming and Nebraska and Kansas and other high plain states as being part of an ancient sea. And when geologists like colleagues of mine over here on the left are out here looking at these layered rocks, we're kind of scratching our heads and going, well, okay, these rocks were deposited in a sea. Well, where in the sea were they 
deposited on the beach because beaches can have piles of sands on them? Or were they deposited in a delta like at the end of the Mississippi River where there are also big piles of sand? Or maybe were they deposited on the bottom of the sea where guess what? There's also sand. And so some of the ways that we can decipher how these piles of sand get layered and turn into rocks is by looking at the crystals and the grains and the cements and the other the chemistry and the other structures that are microscopic inside those rocks. So of course we'd like to go out in the field and collect a bunch of rock samples and there's nothing more fun than coming back to the lab and bashing on a rock and cutting it and slicing it and dicing it. And here's a bunch of our interns from last su uh, summer having fun in the lab, getting all muddy, slicing up these rocks and uh, crushing them into little pieces. And sometimes we slice them into little layers that we shine light through and look at them in a microscope, or we take those uh, sandstones and we crush them up and actually pick out the individual types of grains in them to decipher, gosh, how did that sandstone form? And so in this case, this is one of these crazy um, slices of rock called a thin section that we're shining light through. And you can see these kind of rounded quartz grains here. And uh, next to this red arrow is a very long blade-like grain of, of quartz that kind of looks like it blasted out of a volcano recently. It might have. And in the middle of this slide right here is a picture of a real angular kind of diamond-shaped grain. This is called a zircon. And it's one of these grains that's almost as hard as a diamond. And it also is a grain that typically forms in volcanoes. And so when we shine different kinds of light through it, we can make different colors and identify very specifically what these minerals are. But sure enough, in addition to the sort of everyday quartz sand grains that you're used to having a uh, move through your toes when you're on the beach, um, these rocks are of the Codel sandstone are actually full of all these volcanically derived grains that probably were blasted out of a volcano or maybe worked their way into the sands um, from reworking of the ash from that volcano. So pretty cool. So um, one of the things we do with these grains is uh, we pull them out of the rock and we've got colleagues up in Idaho and here in Denver that do this and uh, they um, put them into special scientific instruments and zap them with lasers or dissolve them partially with chemicals to kind of read their, their, their DNA, if you will, of the grains to figure out both how old they are and where did they come from. And I wanna show you some of that data today. It hasn't even been published yet. So here's a sneak peek. So this is a crazy diagram here. And on the bottom axis of this diagram is the age of individual grains that come out of a, a sandstone. In this case, we're surfing the Codel sandstone. So these ages go back to 400 or 4,000 million years or 4 billion years. And on the left, this is kind of the abundance or the amount, the relative amount of those types of grains we have. And so here's a general sandstone from Colorado here that we've kind of dissolved up and zapped all the grains in and figure out how, how old they are. And in this case, there's kind of a big bump right here here above uh, 1,000. And so that means that this sample has a bunch of grains that are about 1,000 million or a billion years old. And it's got a bunch of grains that are other ages too, like 500 million or 100 million. Ready to see what the grains in the Codel look like? Wow, when we saw this, our heads exploded. So it turns out the Codel, this is the sample from the Codel, basically has nothing going on. Over here, there's not very many really old grains in it. Almost all the grains in the Codel are really young, about 96 million year old grains. And so we analyzed a couple other samples of these and bingo, bango, bongo, we got the same number. Almost all the grains in the Codel were of the same age and they were really young. And remember, these are these little diamond shaped crystals I just showed you a minute ago. They're mixed in with the sand grains. And we analyzed other ones and again, got very similar answers, 95, 94, 93 million year old grains. And so one of the things that our team's trying to do is to figure out what this is telling us. And we're pairing this information about the chemistry of the minerals and the age of the minerals um, together with information from the field. Like here's a rock up here uh, from up near Fort Collins with my hammer and it's got some kind of bumpy structures in it. And those bumpy structures are formed by submarine currents that are moving along and waves and things like that. And they might tell us the direction that, uh, of currents that might've brought these uh, 95 million year old grains into this environment. So um, that's something we're working on right now. And one of the uh, ways we're doing that is also going back to the field. So here's me looking at a volcanic ash bed um, up um, just north of here in Denver that's below the Codel sandstone. It might reflect some of that volcanic activity that's bringing these young grains into the system. Um, another thing that is, just kind of blew my mind is this is up in Wyoming. And you know what, if you've got any kitty litter in your house, 
you probably got some of this rock in your house here. So these beautiful scallop shaped structures are actually beds of what are called bentonite. It's basically a giant volcanic ash deposit that's right below what would be the equivalent of the Codel sandstone. And so we're trying to figure out, gosh, could some of these have been washed into that rock unit or somehow um, a similar process resulted in, in, in the enrichment of those volcanic grains. So um, stay tuned for the answer on that one. But one of the things that we've also been doing, since this is a useful unit of rock, um, like many other geologists, we want to know how much of it is there and where is it? And so this is a map of um, eastern Colorado here. Here's the Front Range uh, Mountains. Denver's right about here. Pueblo's down about here. Kansas is over on the right. And the green area indicates where there are surface outcrops or exposures of the Codel sandstone, like the one I showed you in the first slide of this talk. That you could actually go put your hand on and study. And there's a little bit of that here along the Front Range, um, but most of the Codel is actually below our feet in the surface. And fortunately, we've got a lot of data from wells and um, boreholes that have been made that let us know where the Santa Codel is. And this kind of crazy psychedelic colored map is actually showing the thickness of the Codel sandstone below the surface. And red means thicker, it's about 40 feet thick, and yellow means pretty thin, it's about 10 to 20 feet thick. And so the thing that uh, really surprised us when we plotted this out, and this is actually uh, data from Gus Gustafson and, and uh, Marshall Deacon and others, is that, whoa, th there's a big gap in the distribution of Codel. Where, where is the Codel below our, our feet? In fact, we were expecting, and I think many other geologists were expecting to see a kind of a big pancake of these sands below our, our feet or maybe a big long V-shaped valley of, of Codel sandstone reflecting deposition in an ancient canyon or a bay or something like that. Instead, you know what this big, uh, big uh, circular um, feature looks like? Looks like a donut. Oh, oh my gosh. No, Homer Simpson didn't put it, put it there because this is even older than he is. But um, we went back again and remapped out the distribution of these rocks with uh, a team of people, Ginny Gent and Mark Longman and Rich Botcher. And, and it turns out that actually the distribution of the Codel is still weird, but it, it might not be a donut. But again, the Codel's really thick up here in Northern Colorado and Southern Wyoming. It's thick down in Southern Colorado and there's a big gap in the middle, you know? And it kind of looks like a, a C in cross section. And so we were trying to figure out, well, what environments on earth look like that? Well, we don't have the answer to that question yet, but I do know something that this reminds me of. And it's something that, all of us have had fun with one day or another. Pac-Man, exactly. Well, I don't think that the Pac-Man accounts for the distribution of the Codel, but this is a project that we're working on and looking forward to answering. And I think the answer isn't necessarily in the subsurface. It might be out in the rocks like these ones right here. And I'm really looking forward to going back out with a team of people. And who knows, maybe I'll see you out there and we'll go surf some of these sandstones and see if we can find any more secrets to understand in the Codel. So thanks so much. I'm looking forward to your questions. Have an awesome day. Memory, does anybody have any questions they uh, want to? Yes, we do have some questions. Yes, we have a few on Facebook. And let me just introduce myself. Hello, my name is Memory, and I am in the marketing department here at the museum. I'm just popping up like I always do to share your questions exactly Ooh, with our presenter. Okay, so we do have some on Facebook and I am monitoring YouTube as well. So if you're watching on YouTube, drop your question there and we will get it answered. Oh, we have a few questions in here. All right, James, so we have one from Sarah who asks, this is a pedestrian question. What sort of blade cuts those thin sections that included such hard grains? That's a great question, Sarah. So what we use what's called a rock saw blade and you might have seen one of these blades um, being used to cut concrete, maybe in your neighborhood or along the highway. And what they are actually doing is kind of a little secret is we don't actually cut the rocks, we sand through them. And so on the edges of these blades are actually microscopic diamonds. And if you've ever seen concrete get cut or erode, they're using a lot of water with these saws and the water is just removing the ground up rock or in that case concrete or pavement um, with that water and kind of keeping the blade cool but the blade is really moving so fast it's actually sanding the surface of that uh, rock or, or concrete down with microscopic diamonds that are embedded in the edges and I know you're thinking wow in my garage I've got a treasure trove of diamonds well <laughs> I don't think they put any of them on your finger but uh, they're still pretty cool 
Awesome, awesome. All right, and we have another question from Linda. Um, she is commenting a question for Caitlin, who is age eight. And Caitlin asks, is she's wondering if there are minerals in lava? Oh my gosh, Caitlin, first of all, awesome question. I've got an eight year old too named Lucy. And uh, Caitlin, there indeed are minerals in lava. And what happens is as lava cools really slowly, underground lava forms big crystals. And sometimes those big crystals are pink or white or gray, and they might form a rock we call granite. But if that lava goes out and spews on the surface and bleh, forms, Sometimes it crystallizes so quickly that it doesn't have time to form crystals that you can see with your naked eye. And it might form a rock type called obsidian or basalt. And for those of you tuning in here from Colorado, um, we've got a beautiful example of that over on North and South Table Mountain near Golden. Those flat top mountains are ancient, the four ancient lava flows on there. Or go check out the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And those, uh, that Devil's Tower uh, actually is made up of very similar rocks. So those kinds of lava flows, depending on whether they ooze on the surface or blast out or, or actually they don't really blast out, but you know, sputter out or mm -hmm. cool below the surface can form crystals. Um, one of the most common and to me coolest crystals uh, um, that uh, forms in basalt is a mineral called olivine. And you might know it as peridot or peridot, depending on how you pronounce it. And it's a really cool green mineral. And it's, I can't remember which month's birthstone it is, but it's a birthstone too. So um, take a look for that in the little bubbles of, uh, uh, or bubble-like features in uh, basalt next time you see one. Awesome. Thank you for that question, Caitlin. All right. And our questions are rolling in. We have another one from Michael who says, can you explain the process that results in collected veins of like minerals? For example, how does gold or silver, silver or copper group into veins of the same element? And he has a follow-up question with this. Does volcanic activity bring the heavy elements up from the deep to closer to the surface? Yet how does the element stay grouped and is not dispersed? Wow, that's like a lot. Do we have an hour? Um, the short version is yes, and it depends. The longer, more intermediate scale answer is that in fact, um, volcanic activity does bring up a lot of fluids from the earth. And in fact, it may not be in what you might think of as a traditional volcano, but the inner hot sweat, if you will, of the earth that's coming up from like the pit of the avocado. The earth is kind of like an avocado, right? Okay. It's tasty, but it's got a core that's about the size of the pit. The food mm -hmm. part that you eat in the avocado, the tissues, the mantle, and then the crust is kind of like the crinkly skin on the avocado. Mm -hmm. And so um, there are a lot of food, uh, food, a lot of fluids <laughs> coming up from the kind of food part of the avocado, the mantle, the earth, and oozing its their way up. And those fluids oftentimes carry a lot of metals and uh, what are called sulfide, uh, that lead to the formation of what are called sulfide minerals. So things that might have gold or silver or lead or zinc or other kind of metal uh, rich uh, minerals or elements that form metal rich minerals. Um, and that they will oftentimes as they come up to the surface, they're, um, they might cool their environment, the amount of pressure in the area, whether it be a crack or a fissure that they're in might change. And that change might allow those things to start kind of growing, if you will, like rock candy in the, in the crevices and cracks or bugs of a um, of, of other rock in the crust. So that's that's kind of the short generalized answer. So yeah. 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 How about we take a few more questions? We have this sure. one from Chris who says, where were the volcanoes? Where were the volcanoes? They're all over the earth. Right? I mean, the last volcano to erupt in Colorado was about 4,100 years ago, and Native people saw it. It dammed the river, right? Um, volcanoes are going off all the time as the continents move around and sea floor, sea floor uh, plates that are underneath the oceans come apart. Um, that's basically lava coming out of the fissures, what would you call a mid-ocean ridge. Hawaii is a volcano. It's been going off for millions of years, you know? Um, volcanoes are active all over the world. Um, so, yeah. Volcanoes are everywhere. Um, we have an active dynamic planet. If we were a dead planet, um, we wouldn't have an atmosphere like the one we have right now. We probably wouldn't have vegetation. We wouldn't um, uh, also have a, a protective 
kind of invisible magnetic envelope that pre prevents us from basically dying or frying from all the cosmic radiation coming from the sun. So there are lots of both visible and um, invisible to our eye uh, benefits of living on a volcanically active planet. It's good for life. All right, awesome. So how about we let the last, last question, it'll be my question. And this is something that I like to ask all of our presenters. And you know, with us going into the holidays, um, we're meeting up or virtually meeting up with our friends and family. What is one cool rock volcano fact that we can just hit people with? And they're like, oh, wow, this person's so smart. What, what is one fact that we can take from your presentation and give to others? Yeah. Um, the one that I think most people will get is that everybody's heard of a geode. Well, a geode is a fossilized bubble. If you think about it, a geode is a bubble that forms at an ancient volcanic deposit where there's gas in there and it's a cavity, right? And so it might be surrounded by brown rock or light rock and geologists have all sorts of crazy names for it, rhyolite, dacite, basalt, whatever. But it's basically a fossilized bubble or a crack that forms, hardens, and then millions of years later, groundwater cruises along, like from the water table, and it works its way into that crack. And um, when it works its way into that, that uh, excuse me, that bubble, um, it's, it's called an, um, an uh, amygdule, if you will, or vesicle, uh, depending on what it's filled with. Um, uh, that uh, water kind of gets into a changing condition. And just like um, you build up a bathtub ring around your bath, especially if you're really dirty, or if you're in the Dead Sea or the Great Salt Lake that salts precipitate or kind of form and those are basically minerals on the edge of the lake, the same thing happens on the inside of that bubble, right? And it forms all sorts of cool minerals. And one of the most common ones is quartz or amethyst, which is made out of silica, right? Silica is the same stuff in glass. You're looking at it on your iPhone, mm -hmm. you're looking at it on this screen, right? And so that, that glass, that silica comes out and makes jagged little crystals inside there on the inside of that, just like the rings of a bathtub. And, uh, and, it, and it can be really pretty. You can have orange ones that, uh, you know, um, might, um, anyways, purple ones, clear ones. And so basically when you crack open a geode, you're cracking open an ancient fossil volcanic bubble, right? Wow. Oh, that's and sometimes cool. they're empty, but mm -hmm. sometimes they have really cool stuff in them like amethyst or citrine, which is basically orange amethyst or orange quartz. And so anyways, nice. yeah. Nice. All of this is making me want to go down to Gems and Minerals, um, the exhibition at the museum. I don't know about you all, but... We're open and it's right down there. You can definitely go and see some of these gems, minerals that Dr. Hagedorn is talking about. Well, thank and you. Actually, there's a huge geode in there. It's purple and it has a secret compartment in the back. Mm -hmm. And I won't tell you where that secret compartment is or the, what's in it, but you can see it if you go to the museum. And I have heard that certain geologists that work at the museum have stuck stuff in there and maybe even done a couple of wedding proposals in it. So anyway, see if you can the next time you're at the museum. Interesting, a hidden gem and a gem in the museum, which is also a gem. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Hagedorn. And like we said, this is our final Science Division Live episode for this year. So thank you all for joining us throughout this crazy year that we've had. <laughs> And we will so goodbye 2020. Hello 2021 and have an awesome holiday. Exactly. Thank you all.